Thank you for coming to the screening today. Um, yeah, I'm joined by the wonderful Lou McNamara and Kyla Harris. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself, uh, um, audio describe myself for anyone that's tuning in later that's visually impaired. So I'm a black man wearing a wide brimmed hat, black jumper, um, black skinny jeans, and of course, black shoes. Um, I'm a white femme person in my late twenties with pink hair and a white t-shirt, black trousers, black shoes. I am a brown woman in my uh, late thirties. My birthday's next week. So I'm aging right before your eyes. Um, and I am wearing a red kind of pinafore-ish dress with a black turtleneck. Perfect. So I'm going to dive right in. Um, I'm interested in what led you onto this journey and why you both chose film and TV as a medium. So what, with what in film and TV resonates with you personally? And that's to both of you. <laughs> I know that look, and that's look, that look is you go first. <laughs> um, so for me, I um, wasn't a huge like TV film person um, in my childhood. It was like we had like three channels and it was in black and white because I lived in the middle of nowhere in a small town in Canada. Um, and then about five years ago, five, six years ago, I was really unwell for a long period of time. And it was kind of me being in bed and not really being able to connect with the outside world in the way that I wanted to. And I just kind of immersed myself in TV and film because that's all that I could really kind of handle. Um, and so that made me feel connected and it made me feel like I was able to empathize and travel in ways just to kind of from my bed in the position that I was in. Um, but also I think what connected me to TV and film is that um, I'm a really visual person and um, and it, it, it's such an incredible visual art form um, and way of, of, of storytelling ultimately. I think that's really powerful. Um, I think it's really powerful to think about the uh, film and TV industry as such an accessible form of media that can tell stories in different communities. And I think that really resonates with that point. Mm. What about you, Lou? Um, same, I grew up without many TV channels, not watching that many films, it wasn't a big part of my life. Um, but I'm a super slow reader and I think I just learned about the world through documentaries as soon as I figured out how to access them um, and just watched everything I could. Um, and yeah, I'm really into documentary and factual entertainment. I'm also a massive camera nerd. Um, I was playing with like disposable cameras and stuff ever since I was a little kid. And um, now I do that professionally. Um, and so that gets me working in the film industry. But I'd say the thing I watch the most of is reality TV, um, <laughs> which is why I really wanted to make some and like put, put all of that research I've been doing for so many years. Um, and it does feel like that. It feels like exciting and fresh. And I, I think you really kind of hit the nail on the head when trying to look at what modern reality TV feels like, but also tell some new fresh stories. So I really admire that. And I think also what you said um, kind of feeds into what I said earlier about access, but in the opposite vein, when actually TV, TV and film documentaries, it, it isn't f uh, freely accessible when you're from like a working class or low income background. So like and film and TV generally isn't accessible from a, a, like a low income and, and working class background. So I think that's a valid point to make as well. <laughs> yeah, so what are your expect what were your expectations going into this project and did it meet them? Um, was it, a, was the finished result a ways away from what you intended or was it pretty similar to what you set out to do. And again, that's both of you. So when we first spoke about this, we were thinking quite traditional documentary. We were talking about something to do with the economies of care. Um, and we were chatting on Zoom when we saw the um, film and video umbrella beyond um, application, which is what the, we successfully got. And then that funded us making this project. Um, and Kyla just one day was like, why don't we make reality TV? Why don't we do this challenge? Because we talk about our love of reality TV so much um, and compare notes on all the shows we're watching. Um, and yeah, she just challenged me and I said yes. And then um, it all went from there. And when we were making, shooting it, we kind of, we hedged our bets a bit. We were like, well, we should give ourselves both options. We don't know if this reality TV thing is gonna work. Like maybe it'll be a more straight doc. So we kind of shot for both. Um, and then in the edit, it kind of worked out um, and we were so happy to, yeah kind of see that hybrid come out of what we'd been shooting. Cause yeah, it was, it was so much, so much happened in that week to 
kind of cut down to this half an hour. So um, it really could have gone lots of different ways. Yeah, it was also supposed to be maybe more like five to ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and we just like fell in love with kind of working together and really doing this ourselves. And it is, you know, we had a lot of um, people helping us like Loretta, uh, who's here, who you know from the film now, who's in the in the front row. You know, she was assisting a lot um, as well. And I had another personal assistant who was there who's not um, pictured. And although film is like a very collaborative kind of medium, the bulk of the work was Lou and I. And so that allowed us to really like shape our own narrative and also shape our own kind of ways. So when we have these piece to camera interviews, when we're behind the kind of colored coloramas in the backgrounds, um, we're interviewing each other. So um, it's really, yeah, our narr narrative, like by disabled people for disabled people and by allies for allies. That's yeah. brilliant. And also like, I think that's an important segue into like how it was funded for any aspiring filmmakers that want to do similar things. How are you, because I saw at the end it's funded by Arts Council. And that's really interesting to me knowing that the BFI, usually the BFI funds film, Arts Council funds like, everything else mm -hmm. so what were the complexities of that funding and, and what was the process to get funding for this so film video umbrella was the right. body that funded it and they're an arts council funded organization oh, yeah. so they have to get us to put the arts council logo at the end <laughs> but they get the money from arts council and um arts council yeah doesn't like to fund much film stuff because they see that as something the film funders do but they do film uh, fund artist moving image yes. uh, so yeah that was something that we had to think about a lot when we were writing our application is like we've both been to art school we both like we met through um working the visual arts and working in kind of arts council funded projects and spaces but we were consciously kind of trying to be artist moving imagists yeah. when we were writing our application <laughs> thinking about how <laughs> yeah how to present for these different kind of applications and i think what made it artist moving image for me at least was that it was this hybrid format that we hadn't seen done before and that we didn't think would happen in other funding spaces yeah, because it's a non-traditional style that we were trying to go for. Yeah, and that allowed us to be really creative. So I think it is, I think with funding, it is about finding ways of applications that you think might not necessarily suit what you're initially going for, but then seeing how that can work. Because I think when you have limitations or parameters or some kind of agenda, even from a funder, it can make you be more creative. Yeah, and I definitely think there's like uh, something to be said about during that film process, you don't really know how it's gonna end anyway. So in the edit is where you start to think consciously about what you want the end, end result to be, what you've got, what you can make it into. So really don't have a, you, you shouldn't, well you should, but you don't really have an exactly formed idea of what it's gonna end up like until you're, you're in that edit suite. Yeah. Sorry, keep closing my notes everyone. <laughs> Um, it's personal was such a rich introspective of your everyday life, some of the complexities of COVID and the deeper, deeper emotional is impacts of issues that are resonant throughout the world right now. And the transparency in it is really powerful on screen. Was it difficult to be so intimate with Lou and the camera and also vice versa, Lou, because you were also quite intimate in the film? Um, well, I think some of the feedback, which I haven't shared with Lou yet, but um, <laughs> there were, I got some feedback the other week that that we don't actually describe our feelings around each each other that much about about the process in a way and i think i i was really <laughs> i kept on trying to surprise lou by being like oh my gosh this has to happen to my body and she'd be like yeah <laughs> and like that doesn't make very good tv <laughs> so <laughs> So there were there would be times where we'd film a lot of like I'd feel like really vulnerable about something and like divulge it and she'd be like yeah cool, and it would just it would just take any kind of um, like story that I'd had around uh, it or like any kind of sting out of what I was feeling or any nerves. I mean the thing is, is that like Lou is just so unique in the way that she kind of like empathizes and that we relate to each other and that like I've you know, met very few allies who are so kind of like embedded in and the understanding of disability justice as Lou. And um, because of that, it just made being vulnerable really easy. And also I feel like there's kind of a difference between like being vulnerable and just being honest. Yeah. And um, I think a lot of people think that I'm being vulnerable when I'm be just being honest and off. And, and sometimes as well, there's, 
a line that I want to mention between like vulnerability and also just um, disclosure as well. Um, and when I do have someone doing my care, like that is absolutely a vulnerable position to be in because I'm often kind of like hiring someone, they come in and a minute later, I'm like, here's my vagina. And um, that's like, that's out of necessity, not out of choice. Um, but I, with with Lou, it was just really easy because because of her kind of deepest sen- sense of empathy. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I think same. I could never, I wouldn't have been in front of the camera if it wasn't for Kyla forcing me to. I normally situate myself very firmly behind it. Um, so yeah, if, if it wasn't for kind of the trust that Kyla is able to kind of hold that space for me um, and make me feel comfortable, I would never have got in front of it. And then when I did, she surprised me again and again, like the inter- especially the very first interview we did was when I was isolating for 14 days before we moved in together and I was in my childhood bedroom and she interviewed me over zoom which was like quite a complicated setup to be able to try and make sure I was in focus as well as like making it all work sat on my bed and then suddenly she hit me with these questions that were like super emotional for me and um then I didn't look back at that interview for I don't know five months until we were in the edit process and again trying to like edit myself being emotional on camera, which are all things I'm really uncomfortable (laughs) with, was so hard. And I had this little mini breakdown during the edit. I was like, I can't edit this, we need an editor. Um, But Kyla just held my hand through that whole process and, you know, wrote the most detailed notes of every second of every cut so that together we could do those edits that wouldn't be possible for, I think, either of us to do on our own. That's really cool. Yeah, I can understand like being behind the camera myself and like having that having to switch that up would be really kind of, yeah, daunting for me. Be like, oh, what am I doing? Um, yeah, so I, I think that it's interesting that you said that, Kyla, about like you wanting to surprise Lou and, and that you, you th- like the feedback that you got was that there wasn't a lot of emotion between you both. And I definitely saw flashes of that in like, you know, the preview where it was like in episode two, where I felt that there was some contention there, which made me really looking forward to like watching episode two because I was like, oh, it's about to get juicy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I love the conversations around connection and boundaries. There was such a natural and nuanced chemistry between you and Lou. Can you talk a little bit about the inception of that project within that realm? Like, yeah. Mm. Within within the realm of like boundaries. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it does just boil down. To, it's, this is just going to be a boring answer. It just boils down to trust again, I think, because of knowing knowing that Lou isn't like exploiting me for drama (laughs) is kind of that those were my boundaries. I guess one of the things that came up was that it was in the middle of a heat wave and um, my body, uh, like if there's really hot extreme temperatures, it reacts pretty um, flamboyantly, shall we say. (laughs) And um, was really, it, it was like 35 degree weather and um, which like is never heard of in the UK, of course. And um, like the, the cameras were shutting down we weren't able to film because like the cameras are, were overheating. My body was overheating. I wasn't really able to like leave bed or think or do anything. And um, I just felt this overwhelming sense of like failure of like, I, you know, can't can't kind of continue and what does this mean for the project what does this mean for us um like as a friend do you know am I am I letting my friend down and um and Lou was just like so like okay well we'll just ch- we'll just change it we'll just shoot the pilot we'll just shoot it as a pilot as a one-off and you know with a hint to kind of something else and and that's fine and like we are our own authors and we can do that um and that just that really kind of changed everything so like my I guess my body's my body put up boundaries and um I needed to hold those boundaries in order to kind of recover really and um and 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 that made the work richer as well I think I think for us it's a new way of making reality tv as well like all those shows that I love and are super juicy are also super exploitative most of the time and the contributors or Um, cast members of it have very very little control over their representation Um, and it was really cool to be able to control that so by interviewing each other 
we could push each other, like kind of could exploit me a little bit for the drama, but know how much I was willing to do that and hold me through that and vice versa. And same with thinking about how we edited it. And I think having like having a trust based producer relationship was so lovely um, and I think can make for a, a different kind of vulnerability than we're used to seeing on reality TV. Yeah, and I, one that's like more ethical. <laughs> you know? I think that was that was a good point, actually, like at one point. I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to say this on camera. And she's, Lou was just like, we can edit it out. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, the magic of film. You know, kind of thing. Um, so I think that's that's it as well, is kind of really, yeah, being, again, like being being our own authors and being, it was kind of like a burden and a, and a fantastic kind of relief for both of us to be in control and have that much, yeah that much control over it all. I think that's really interesting. Like as a documentary filmmaker, how different is that from like your your normal documentary filmmaking? How much how much different was it working on a trust based relationship than working mm -hmm. in the industry on, on a documentary as a cinematographer or as a documentary filmmaker? So I guess I've been really lucky on the documentaries I've made, I've been working with teams again who I trust and for whom like the ethics of it are really important and it's been a big consideration and sometimes or that's often about um contributor safety in the previous um, stuff i've done so about anonymity and not just how we shoot them anonymously but how we uh like do the wider kind of safeguarding work to protect like any data relating to them if we could be putting them at risk um and thinking about yeah all those steps rechecking in with them that we still we still have their consent that their situation or their um say their right to remain in this country if um when I was making a film about immigration detention centres, um, like what situation that was in and when we were getting to the point of distribution or releasing. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been a lot about safeguarding concerns and trying to make sure that everybody is on the same page and in control in that sense. Um, and also able to watch it and see what's going on. I Yeah, I feel like a lot of the TV that I watch, just that's not the norm. Um, contributors are kind of, yeah, their, their recording is captured and then that's it. They don't get a say. Um, and I guess the, the situations where I've not given someone a say, actually, because I was thinking about this with the ethics of it, was um, when I was trying to interview war criminals. Um, so I did make a conscious decision then to capture that interview, get that release form, and not go back to be like, are you OK with me accusing you of war crimes? Um, and uh, I guess, yeah, the ethics around that for me was like, I had to make a decision to be like, yeah, I don't think that these people will be happy with that. And I'm willing to make that choice because I think that this story is in the public interest. Um, and that they won't want to admit to those things. And I'm, yeah, but you've got to think about why why and when you're making those decisions. I think that's really interesting. And I think it plays on screen, the richness of the story. And also kind of like, it, you know, when you're making films and you're making films that are scripted or you're making films that are a documentary film, make it films that you kind of um, use your curatorial eye to decide what goes in and what's out. It always has a different rhythm from the natural rhythm of a film. So I think like the richness of that really plays on screen with this. What are some of your proudest moments during the shoot? Oh, I know mine. <laughs> oh, okay, go, go for it, go for it. When I catheterized myself on the first time and you were like, you're going to need six catheters. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, yeah, that, well done. That was great. <laughs> that was good. Um, I mean, the whole, I think the whole thing was like, I was just so proud of, of the process because I think we, we were so immersed in it. And I think it was something like we were, you know, it was, it was during a freaking pandemic that we're still in. So thank you so much for being here as well in person. Um, and it was, you know, I remember, I think one of my proudest moments was actually a, um, we were like, I was making food as well during this whole time and I'm like a total food snob. And so I was making like pretty big meals for us while we were shooting and like Lou would be like backing up the, the cards and stuff like that. Um, but one of my proudest moments was when we decided to order sushi and it was like, I'm going to, we're gonna splurge. And it's like, we don't know even if takeaway is even safe right now or not. And like we, the, the sushi delivery person went right by my door and I was like, no, 
I'll be back. And I like left Loretta and Lou and I left the home and went like charging after this sushi person and like tracked him down. I hunted that sushi and I like brought it back home and I felt like I was like the proudest I was so cave woman ever. I was so worried as well. I like looked out the door and then I could I looked down both sides of the street and kind of had entirely different. Like, this is like the furthest you've left your house since the start of the pandemic is to get our sushi. Like we were not losing people. I mean, but also completely worth it. <laughs> yes, yes, it was totally worth it. Yeah. So we got a taste of it, but what would an It's Personal Blooper Reel look like? <laughs> well, a, a lot of Lou talking to herself, um, because there was this time where I was like, I can't, I got it, I got to rest. So I was resting and Lou was just downstairs filming herself, like talking to the seagulls and drinking coffee. Um... <laughs> We, I mean, there's so, there's so many, pr- probably about 16 different versions of me being like, I'm a boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> True. What else? There's a lot of like, just stuff that I'd like, I, maybe it's not blooper reel, just all the like, endless conversations and mornings hanging out and like, pulling cards together, doing angel cards. <laughs> and oh, yeah. Where like, there's so many nice bits and conversations with Loretta that we didn't necessarily mm-hmm have like you know all the angles or like it wouldn't work in the edit necessarily or maybe we just didn't have time to get into it in this episode but um but so many like special and fun moments and ridiculous bits yeah i personally can't wait to see them (laughs) (laughs) so thinking about wheelchair uses on set and also access and accessibility generally what advice do you have for producers that want to make their um their sets more representative and want to increase their access on, on set I am so excited you asked, Rico, because I have a great pitch for this. So um, I am a, I am a part of Forward Doc, which is stands for Filmmakers with Disabilities, and uh, in documentary. And if you go to forward dash doc dot something or other, I don't. Okay, I'm not. It's not the greatest pitch. <laughs> I take it back. Um, but it's uh, a group of us, includes including um, Jim Lebrecht, who is the. Uh, filmmaker from uh, the director, co-director of Crip Camp, as well as Lindsay Dryden, an Emmy Award winning producer, and several other um, documentary filmmakers across the US and the UK. And um, I co-wrote uh, like a 60 page Bible on how to make filmmaking more accessible in documentary. Um, and I th- and there are two of them. One is called the toolkit, uh, uh, is a toolkit and another one is an engagement pack. And it has, um, everything from like a brief introduction to disability justice and the social model of disability to um, a kind of marketing and making your own events to um, making sets more accessible. Um, what I think needs to happen though more widely is to have um, access coordinators on every single set on any kind of high-end TV or film film set where um, there's someone there that's not that's not the disabled person who's within um, the film, um, either behind or in front of uh, behind or in front of the camera, that is there for disabled people to talk about their access requirements and to make sure that they happen. So it's not the weight isn't on the disabled person, and also there's so much hierarchy within film, and it can often be really difficult to advocate for your requirements when it's someone that you're wanting to be hired from again and by again. And um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd look at those, I'd look at those, uh, the engagement pack and the toolkit. And, um, and also if there's a chance to advocate for um, access coordinators on set. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting you say that. I think, like I imagine it to be some, like um, Michael B. Jordan had an inclusion rider that he uses. So mm-hmm. if he, if he, the only way that Michael B. Jordan will agree to do a film is if the, a certain percentage of the cast and crew are from ethnically diverse backgrounds. So I think about it like it should be the people that are in positions of power advocating for more inclusion on set so it doesn't damage the reputations and the careers of in, of people that are underrepresented in our industry. Um, sure. yeah. 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 I think we also need like a fundamental shift in how filmmaking is done. Like the sets I work on are like just like oozing with inaccessibility in every way. And until we change the working conditions so that 
it, it becomes like possible to do without pushing yourself to the very brink mm -hmm. um, it's never going to be accessible um, there's also it's just not thought about on so many sets there's so many studio sets that could be accessible and aren't um, but until we cut the working hours down like just make them possible for anybody also people with caring responsibilities um, like to be able to be part of this industry it's not it's not going to change and I think yeah producers need to have a real like rethink of how they prioritize how they schedule days and think about the whole logistics of filmmaking yeah it's wild that like it, unless you go on a set that the director is really uh inclusive and really thinking about care of the set or the producer is thinking about care on the set that filmmaking is actually really horrible <laughs> like oh, yeah. the process of filmmaking is awful um and that's usually because of like bad behaviors and also because of like the hours that people yeah. work and thinking about protections for staff it's really something that does need a fundamental shift yeah you know, and then you see it's totally possible like we were both on a documentary together for a week recently with a predominantly disabled crew and it was it was possible and it was great and everybody had a better time <laughs> like yeah, yeah. yeah like one of the films we showed this weekend um I think it's already been showed from tape uh, collective and a tape uh, tape film community and, and film um it was done with a with an entirely disabled cast and an entirely disabled crew and one of the biggest bits of feedback about that was that it was such a nice envi environment to be on mm -hmm. so it's like yeah it, it can change it's just, it's just not changing and that's really frustrating um so what does the future have in store for for you both Tell us about projects you're working on. Give us the goss. Oh, um, well, I just found out this. Uh, I'm writing a scripted series um, that's in development with Channel 4 and the pilot has just been greenlit. So um, that is, yeah, we're going to be shooting that hopefully in the spring. Um, I would, I mean, any chance that I can work with Lou, I uh, would, yeah, I love um I also have a, a pretty frequent collaborator called Ella Glendening, and she is, um, yeah, we're hoping to work on a lot of, a lot of other kind of more narrative based, based films. I mean, I, I couldn't professionally do it, but inside I'm squealing for you. <laughs> 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 well, what about you, Luke? Uh, yeah, continuing to be a professional camera nerd uh, most of the time by day, um, and then working with Kyla as much as possible. Um, yeah, currently been DOPing a documentary with her and Ella Glendening, um, which is awesome. And we're yeah, still in production. Um, and yeah, we're also trying to make it personal a series. So if there's any development producers out there, um, <laughs> anybody who wants to help uh, get in touch, because yeah, we're, we're keen to make more. Yes, that too. Cool. And my final question is, what are both of your three top tips for making a docuseries slash reality TV drama? I think it would be to hold your boundaries um, and to be inclusive and mindful of what like works for you and uh, the cast and crew, because I think it is so important to bring aspects of care into filmmaking. Um, so I think that's one tip. Um, I think. <laughs> Yeah, schedule and plan as much as possible in advance because you cannot shoot everything. And even the amount like we were shooting was so exhausting and overwhelming, like just because it felt like we were either shooting or cooking and offloading and charging everything to continue shooting constantly. Um, and then also feeling like we were missing out on shooting the bits where we couldn't because we were eating or charging batteries um, and like being as planned as possible with your schedule for like times to shoot and times to not shoot yeah. I think is really um, yeah good practice and also being willing to totally throw that schedule in the air when it doesn't work out and you're over ambitious and being flexible um, around and like gentle on yourselves to change as you need. That's really interesting actually with documentary filmmaking because I've never personally done it and I'm guessing a lot of people in the audience haven't done it I know with narrative filmmaking you have you go in with a shot list you go in with an idea of the shots you want from the angles that you want and you have like whether you want a close-up whether you want a wide wide angle is that the same for documentary do you go in there with a really good idea of what you want to shoot what you want to see on screen um <laughs> <laughs> you try and plan as much as you can but um with the knowledge that it might all change on the day um so i think yeah trying to think of it as like windows or scenes of like stuff where you can control it so that you give yourself the space to put the camera down because 
otherwise yeah, you spend the entire day um, non-stop feeling you should shoot everything and the quality of what you shoot then goes down as well, I think. Um, so yeah, giving yourself that structure so that when you are shooting, you're shooting stuff that you want to use <laughs> um, and might look nice <laughs> rather um, than kind of totally inundating yourself. Because also you've got to be kind to your future self in the edit. Like you don't want to watch everything that happened that day from a like, <laughs> janky angle that's, yeah. you know, um, when you're all exhausted. So yeah, trying to build in that structure but within that, giving yourself flexibility to respond to what is happening. That's really interesting. Uh, go back to uh, something that uh, Chloe Zhao said on a panel for The Eternals recently, where it's like most of the scenes that she shot were during golden hour, so she didn't actually plan for what was going to happen in those scenes because they only had an hour to get them. Mm -hmm. So like literally she'd go in there and be like, we're shooting here at this time, but what's going to actually happen on screen is completely up to you as long as you follow the characters and the narrative of what you've been portrayed. And I think that's a really interesting way of shooting narrative film and documentary. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, any other top tips? Um, I guess my the, the third tip out of our collective three tips um, <laughs> is, is, to, is just good communication. Um, I think that it's so easy sometimes to let that slide. Um, but I think if you just have like good, fair, honest communication just in life is really helpful. <laughs> um, and I think it kind of can yeah. make a greater connection again to cast, crew and story. And I think that's, you know, the thing about having a majority of disabled cast and crew went on our last doc. Um, it just, there's just this like access intimacy, which is a Mia Mingus term for Mia Mingus um, that is created that just, I don't know, it just, it's just beautiful. It's very beautiful. Thank you very much. I don't think we're taking audience questions because of COVID regulations and shared mics. Um, so without further ado, can we have another round of applause for Lee McNamara and Tyler Harris? <laughs>